our goal is to give you um, a pretty comprehensive overview uh, of the uh, interpersonal psychotherapy training program. Uh, and we will be progressing today a combination of didactics and role playing. And tomorrow you'll get a chance to break up into groups and do practicing uh, yourselves. So we hope that at the end of this two days you'll have a really good sense of <clears throat> interpersonal psychotherapy. Uh, yes. So just before I begin, a little conflict of interest. Uh, I do receive royalties from a book published by Guilford, uh, Interpersonal Psychotherapy for Depressed Adolescents. This book actually contains the treatment manual. So uh, if you get very interested in the training uh, from today and tomorrow, <clears throat> you can uh, obtain the rest of the manual uh, in the book. And Dr. Young doesn't have any conflict of interest. Interpersonal psychotherapy was originally developed by Jerry Clareman and Myrna Weissman. <clears throat> it was originally developed for adult outpatients, depressed, non-bipolar, non-psychotic adults. And the adult model is a time-limited treatment, generally delivered in 16 to 20 sessions. And as you'll hear about uh, in this workshop, we've shortened the treatment for adolescents to approximately 12 weeks. Just to give you an idea of the work that's been done in interpersonal psychotherapy, in addition to the adolescent model, there are treatment manuals for uh, major depression in adults, both in acute and maintenance treatment, uh, geriatric patients, uh, bereavement-related depression, the adolescents that you'll hear about today, depressed HIV adults, dysthymia in adults. Uh, we have models to be delivered in primary care, uh, a model for bipolar disorder that incorporates social rhythm therapy, conjoint marital therapy, antepartum, postpartum depression, recurrent depression. Uh, and more recently, there have been uh, successful efforts in the global mental health field, uh, adaptations for treating depressed men and women in Uganda. Uh, and in terms of non-mood uh, disorders, IPT has also been uh, adapted for use with uh, populations suffering from drug abuse, bulimia, social phobia, body dysmorphic disorder, chronic somatization, borderline personality, insomnia, and PTSD. At the moment, these are a lot of work that's in progress. The, currently, the one population for which IPT has not been proven to be as successful is a substance abusing population. Uh, those uh, data seem to indicate that it's important to get treatment for your substance abuse problem first and then see whether there's depression and other uh, complications that remain and then apply another treatment after the substance abuse uh, problem has been treated. <clears throat> other IPT resources besides the adolescent manual, uh, Dr. Weissman's comprehensive guide to interpersonal psychotherapy, uh, can provide information on these other adaptations. And if you get very excited about IPT, you can join the International Society of IPT. We have a website where we advertise other trainings uh, and uh, activities that are going on. And we have a meeting uh, every other year in various places. We alternate between Europe and the United States. And it's a very nice meeting where you can get more training in different adaptations. So the basic principles of IPT. <clears throat> Our basic premise is that uh, depression occurs in an interpersonal context and that depression affects relationships and problems in your relationships affect your mood. And we're going to be intervening in both of uh, those areas. We ascribe to the biopsychosocial diathesis model, which means we recognize the importance of biological factors in the role of depression, that people have a genetic predisposition to stress, different temperaments predispose you uh, to psychological problems, as well as the psychological factors playing a role, early life experiences, uh, issues in attachment as a young child. And lastly, we recognize the importance of social factors uh, in depression. What role do your current interpersonal relationships play? What's your current level of social support in terms of helping you manage uh, stress in your life? 
The basic theoretical underpinnings of IPT stem from attachment theory. Uh, John Bowlby's done much research showing that uh, people experience distress and may get depressed when there are disruptions in attachment. Particularly, he did, wrote a lot about the loss of a parent and how that predisposes uh, children and adolescents to depression. Uh, interpersonal theory based on Sullivan and Kiesler have shown that poor attachment can lead to uh, inadequate or problematic interpersonal communication patterns, which again lead to uh, problems in current relationships. And Sullivan also wrote a lot about the importance of a chumship in adolescence, that having at least one very good friend was very important for adolescent positive mental health going into young adulthood. And this is very relevant in IPT, where we really focus on making sure these depressed adolescents are capable of developing at least some significant positive relationships to help them deal with their stressors. And lastly, social theory is an uh, underpinning of IPT in the notion of how poor social support can contribute to the development of depression by influencing your ability to cope with stress. So we all know that if we have something stressful happen to us, we tend to turn to the people who are our support system. If you don't have that support system, it becomes much tougher to deal with that life stressor. Uh, risk factor research also supports the importance of interpersonal relationships in the development and treatment of depression. Uh, researchers have shown that depression, even at sub-threshold levels, uh, is associated with significant interpersonal problems. And a lot of research has found that, particularly with adolescents, that interpersonal experiences are often the precipitants of an onset of depression. And once you're depressed, uh, there's been interesting research showing that you engage in your current relationships differently when you're depressed. And sometimes the way that you're engaging them can also elicit a response from that other person that can exacerbate or maintain your depression. So that being a depressed person in a relationship makes that relationship more complicated and often less rewarding, which in turn maintains the depression. So depression, as we conceptualize it in IPT, consists of three different components, symptom formation, social functioning, and personality. And in short-term IPT, we really focus on the first two components of symptom formation and social functioning. The model of IPT for borderline personality disorder is obviously working on the third component of personality, but as that work has progressed, the treatment has gotten longer and longer, and so it's not as short-term, and oftentimes uh, patients are in treatment for a minimum of 10 months. So that's a whole sort of different model of IPT that we're not going to be talking about today. We're going to be focusing on the first two components. But I always like to caution that in working with depressed adolescents, particularly depressed adolescent girls, oftentimes we'd like to say that they look like they have borderline features because many of them do when they present with a major depression. And I caution you to hold off on making that label till you see what they look like when their depression has remitted because many times they don't tend to look like they still have those borderline features. Uh, so I, uh, suspend your uh, statements on their personalities until you see how they respond to treatment for their depression. So the goals of IPT are to educate your uh, patients about the link between symptoms and things that are going on in their relationships, to focus on decreasing their depression symptoms, and to specifically focus on improving their skills in addressing the problems in their relationships that may be contributing to or exacerbating their depression. So we're not saying that necessarily the interpersonal problem was the complete cause of the depression, but oftentimes it's contributing to and maintaining the depression. And we've shown in our clinical trials that by intervening in the depressions uh, and the significant relationships that we can help the depression to remit. <clears throat> the main strategies of IPT are to identify one of four problem areas that we'll talk about today. Our focus is on current relationships and specifically the interpersonal aspect of their problem. 
And our goal in a short-term <coughs> therapy is to help the adolescent to master their interpersonal context of their depression. Our goal is to help them uh, feel that they're learning skills that they can use in between sessions and after treatment is over, uh, and not to develop a dependence on the therapist for solving their, their difficulties. Uh, the primary components of IPT I like to divide up into three specific domains. There's a large educational component in interpersonal psychotherapy, uh, an affect identification, and an interpersonal skills building uh, component. Psychoeducation, as you'll hear in the workshop, occurs uh, throughout the three different phases of IPT. We'll talk about how we give the limited sick role and educate the adolescent about depression as an illness and how it affects their functioning. And we make an explicit treatment contract for what we'll be focusing on in the treatment. We also spend a good deal of time helping the adolescents learn to label their emotions, to clarify what they're feeling in different situations so that they can better express those feelings in a constructive way in order to help the relationships rather than be destructive in the relationships. And a large part of the therapy is helping the adolescents learn to monitor their emotions uh, in different situations so that they can increase their exposure to situations that create positive feelings and decrease their uh, involvement in relationships and activities that make them feel worse. And lastly, in terms of interpersonal skills building, the therapist models good interpersonal communication skills in the uh, psychotherapy session. Uh, we use our relationship with the patient as a sample of how to practice good communication and good interpersonal skills. Uh, we'll talk later about communication analysis, which is a specific technique where we dissect communication uh, to very specific levels to help the adolescent learn how to conduct their communication differently. We encourage and teach the kids to learn how to see another person's perspective. We do interpersonal problem solving. And we teach all these skills by doing a fair amount of role playing in the sessions in the middle phase of treatment, preparing the teens to be able to go try these skills outside of the therapy session. Our four problem areas that we um, focus on are grief, role transitions, role disputes, and interpersonal deficits. Um, so the main component of the initial phase is conducting an interpersonal inventory, which we'll spend a lot of time on this morning. But your goal and the problem areas that you want to keep in mind as you're conducting your inventory are these four problem areas of grief, role transitions, role disputes, and interpersonal deficits. These are the the domains that you'll be thinking about as you hear about the adolescent's relationships, thinking about which of these areas will be the most beneficial one to focus on in order to target the problems related to their depression. So uh, the adolescent model, why treat depressed teens with IPTA? Uh, at the time that I began this work, there were a number of efficacy studies of IPT with depressed adults showing that it was uh, an effective treatment with this population. And there was a lot being written about the similarity between adult and adolescent depression symptoms. Um, the pendulum has sort of swung in the opposite direction at the moment where more is being written about how adolescent and adult depression is different in the fact that uh, adult depression may be more pervasive, wh whereas adolescents may have uh, certain aspects of their life where they're still functioning okay. They still have interest in their boyfriend or girlfriend, even though they still meet criteria for a major depression. So there's more being written about how they're different, but at the time that we began this work, there were enough similarities that we felt that uh, if this treatment was so effective for adults, it may also be beneficial for the adolescents. Uh, the other attractive part of the treatment for adolescents is its brief duration uh, of three months. Um, if any of you work with adolescents in an open-ended treatment, a lot of times uh, they don't come regularly. And I think uh, in my work in uh, uh, the community surrounding Columbia, 
was we found that many of the kids didn't come regularly because they didn't know when treatment was going to end and it had no end. And so we felt that if we could offer them a package of a three-month treatment that maybe they'd be more inclined to come regularly uh, because they saw that if they worked hard, there would be an ending and they could go back to their uh, regular lives. Uh, and this proved to be true by, by uh, presenting it as a package and time-limited uh, model, we found that the kids were more likely to come regularly and therefore, therefore to get better faster. Uh, we also felt that the orientation to current interpersonal problems was really uh, uh, meeting the adolescents where their focus is. Uh, if any of you have adolescents, work with adolescents, what they really talk most about is their relationships, either their struggle with their parents or no negotiating uh, the difficulties in peer relationships in adolescence, changes in uh, boyfriend and girlfriend and peer groups and peer pressure so that a treatment that was really targeted at those areas seemed to be uh, most appropriate to the teens and we felt would be something that they'd want to engage in more readily. We also were motivated because um, at the time that uh, I began this work, there were a number of studies that had come out showing that even when adolescent depression symptoms remit, their interpersonal problems uh, remain. And so if your symptoms are better, but you're still having a lot of problems in your relationships, you're more likely to be, uh, uh, you're more likely to have risks for relapse. And so we felt that a treatment that would target both the symptoms and the problems in the relationships might be more beneficial to preventing re relapse or recurrence and could also get these kids back into their normal social milieu much faster than an open-handed treatment. <clears throat> Some of the distinguishing features of the adolescent model that uh, we'll talk about today are uh, what we call the limited sick role, which you'll hear about, the fact that we shortened it to a 12-week duration. Uh, as you would expect, working with adolescents, we involve the parents in the treatment. Uh, use of the telephone if the kids can't make it into treatment. This work was begun and continues uh, largely in the Washington Heights area in New York, which is a low-income uh, immigrant community where oftentimes kids were not able to come for therapy, not because they didn't want to, but they had family responsibilities that prevented them from coming to their appointments. And we didn't want to be uh, punitive about that, and we tried to have flexibility in rescheduling as much as possible, but we also wanted to maintain our therapeutic alliance if they couldn't come in that week by using the telephone and calling them and having a mini check-in session, not doing a complete uh, therapy session over the telephone, but checking in, making sure they're doing okay, telling them how much we look forward to seeing them, brainstorming about how we can uh, decrease their barriers to getting in for their next session, uh, and trying to keep the momentum of the therapy going. Also, in working with adolescents, you have to work with schools because most of our depressed teens are having problems either uh, getting to school or their grades are dropping, so there's work to be done with the schools. Sometimes with our families, the therapist has to do more of that liaison work. Other times we encourage the families to get involved with the schools. And lastly, uh, the adult model uh, utilized the grief problem area solely for abnormal grief reactions in adults. And we found in our work with adolescents that IPT can also be effective for adolescents who are experiencing what would qualify as a normal grief reaction but having significant depression symptoms within that bereavement time period. So we do include adolescents who may be suffering from a normal grief reaction. IPT core components that we're going to spend some time on today. As I said earlier, there's a large psychoeducational component. Uh, we spend a good deal of our first session explaining the medical model of the depression illness. The interpersonal inventory, I think, is one of the most uh, significant components of IPT, and we'll spend a lot of time on that this morning. 
where we do a complete assessment of the adolescent's significant relationships. We spend the bulk of our time in the middle phase modifying communication patterns, doing interpersonal problem solving, and parental involvement is an important component when you're working with adolescents, but the IPT model has flexibility so that you can uh, modify the amount of parental involvement on a case-by-case -case basis. So we divide IPT into three phases of treatment. The initial phase is sessions one to four. The middle phase is sessions five to nine. The termination phase is sessions 10 to 12. Parental involvement is, as I said, in all three phases of treatment. In the initial phase, we involve the parents for diagnosis and to explain what interpersonal psychotherapy is. In the middle phase, we bring parents in to work on communication and problem solving with the adolescent as needed. And we like to bring the parents back in the termination phase to discuss with them their adolescent's experience in treatment, the effect of this teen's treatment on the family, because we know that although the family may not be involved in treatment, the teen changing the way they communicate and interact with family members can have an impact on the other people in the family as well and also to assess whether or not they need further treatment, either whether their depression hasn't fully remitted or their depression is better, but there are other issues that remain that they mean, may need treatment for. So the initial phase of treatment we're going to focus on this morning. Um, so the goals of the initial phase are to identify and diagnose the depression symptoms. Uh, most of the adolescents come to us already having had an intake, as they might, at your agency. But we do spend uh, the first session still assessing and reviewing the depression symptoms, and we'll talk about why. We educate them about depression illness. We assign the limited sick role. We explain the theory of why we think IPTA would be an appropriate treatment for them. We conduct the interpersonal inventory. We identify the problem area, and we end the initial phase with our set, setting of the treatment contract. So week one, your session one after your intake where you've gotten a referral uh, and somebody has decided that IPT is the treatment for this adolescent, you will spend your first session, again, reviewing depression symptoms and confirming the diagnosis. We advise that the therapists do this because we use this review of symptoms to help in our education about depression. So you ask about sleep, you ask about appetite, school performance, depressed mood, and then you are able to speak to the, own, the adolescent's own constellation of symptoms representing their depression. And you educate them that this is a real medical illness. We support the medical model of a depression illness and that it is uh, not that you're crazy, but a real medical illness and that it has effects on your functioning and that there are a variety of treatment options. We still always present to the kids that there are different treatments. There's different types of therapy. There's medication. We feel that IPTA is a good treatment to start with based on what we know about them. But if after several weeks this doesn't seem to be working, we will reevaluate and see if there's a need to ch change treatments or add medication. Uh, we assign the limited sick role, which we'll talk about. Um, and we talk about the model and phases of IPT, how it's mostly an individual treatment, but we will be bringing in their parents at various points, and that would be discussed with them. Uh, but it's, it's, for the most part, an individual adolescent treatment. And then we also meet with the parents to provide the si same psychoeducation about the treatment uh, and depression itself. So we have flexibility in terms of the parental involvement in the first phase of treatment. We recommend that you meet with the parents either as an extended first session, so maybe a 75-minute uh, first session, or if that's not possible, that you meet with the parent in between session one and two, but ideally by session two, uh, we would recommend that you've met with the parent, explain to them uh, about uh, what is depression. A lot of times we see parents thinking that 
uh, these symptoms are um, more characteristic of the fact that they feel their child is lazy or they're angry at them and they're trying to get back at them by, for not doing certain things. Uh, and so we need to educate them that low motivation, uh, poor performance in school, <clears throat> not wanting to do your chores, a lot of that is part of a depression illness. When you're feeling really sad and down, you don't have the same amount of energy. So that's part of our conversation with the parents is correcting their misperceptions about the teen's illness. It's important to discuss confidentiality. Uh, we adhere to the standard views of confidentiality. Uh, we'd like to have this be a place where the kids can talk to us uh, knowing that their information will be kept confidential, obviously unless we feel they're a danger to themselves uh, or a danger to others. We also explain to the parents that it's not a complete two-way street for confidentiality. If we meet with the parents and we talk to the parents, we're likely to share that information with the adolescents so that the adolescent doesn't feel that we're having too strong an alliance with the parent and keeping secrets. Um, so we'll talk to the parents about, we're not going to necessarily tell the adolescent everything that they say, but we're going to share with the adolescent what the parent talks to us about. Uh, we also let the parents know that they will be invited in to participate in therapy, often in the middle phase of treatment, uh, and we engage them as the expert on their teen. <clears throat> what I like to tell parents is that you spend more time with your adolescent than I do, so you see a lot more of them. So if you see something that you think is important for me to know about, let me know. If you think I don't have an accurate view of your adolescent, Let's talk about it because you are really the expert. I see them for an hour each week, but you're spending a lot more time with them, so it's important for you and I to work together to figure out how best to help your teenager. Um, and then we share with them the goals of therapy, which are to improve their significant relationships, which will hopefully improve their depression. So meeting with the parent, uh, when did you first notice he had the blues? We want to ask the parents, when did they first notice that their child was depressed? Uh, what kinds of symptoms do they notice about their teen that's got them concerned? As I said, uh, your first session in IPT is doing a, a complete review of depression symptoms. Uh, we recommend using the Hamilton Rating Scale or the Children's Depression Rating Scale as a guide, but it's not mandatory to pick one of those two measures. The goal is to have a checklist, a complete checklist of the DSM depression symptoms so that you make sure you don't miss any. Not all depressed adolescents will come into your office looking very depressed, so sometimes it's tempting not to ask them all the questions that you need to because you, <clears throat> you look at them and you say, well, they don't really look that depressed. But it's really important to ask because a lot of times they're feeling a lot worse than they initially look. Um, and so we do a very complete review using these checklists in the first session, but the beginning of every IPT session begins with a check-in of your depression symptoms. Um, we typically focus on the ones that they endorse in the first session, but generally you're going to check in on sleep, appetite, sad mood, uh, schoolwork, um, anhedonia, and you're always going to check on suicidality because, as you know, for adolescents, just because they weren't suicidal last week doesn't mean they're not feeling more suicidal this week. So it's very important every time you see these kids to ask them about ideation, to ask them about self-harm behaviors so you can assess whether something else needs to be done. In IPT, we also use a mood rating. Uh, those of you who may have attended CBT workshops, we do it in the reverse of most <laughs> CBT therapists. Uh, we use a scale of 1 to 10, but 1 being the best that they could feel and 10 being the worst. Uh, and at the beginning of every session, after we review their symptoms, so after I've asked them about their sleep appetite, and I say, so for this past week, how's your mood been? Can you give me a rating on a scale of 1 to 10 for your sad mood. 
uh, what was your average for this past week, what was your best rating, and what was your worst. Uh, and then we begin to link what's been happening on the days that they felt the best and the days that they felt the worst, because a major part of IPT is helping the adolescents to make that link. Why did I feel better on Tuesday? Why was my mood a three on Tuesday, but an eight on Friday? Well, let's look at what happened those days. Oh, so I hung out with my friends and I was having a good time. That was when I was a three, but I was an eight when I had this blow up with my parents. So it begins to help us to figure out what are the things that are improving your mood and what are the things that are uh, worsening your mood so that we can fix those uh, latter things. <clears throat> the limited sick role. In the adult model of IPT, uh, the therapists often give uh, what they call the general sick role to an adult, where because you're depressed, you're having trouble doing your normal responsibilities uh, at your job, maybe you need help around the house to take care of the kids. Um, and the adult patients were told that until they felt better, it would be okay to find a way to reduce their responsibilities and get help uh, until they felt better. We felt that that was a, a problematic conceptualization to give to the adolescents because the adolescents' major role is going to school, which for the most part they're already not doing so well since they've been depressed. So we revised that concept to be what we call the limited sick role, where we tell the kids that their depression does affect the way that they function in their day-to-day -day life. But instead of uh, giving in to that feeling of wanting to sleep late, get to school late, spend the day on the sofa watching television, that they need to push themselves to do their normal activities as much as possible, even if it's slow going at first, and that as they begin to feel better, it's going to get easier and easier to do those things. So it's, it's not exactly what's pleasurable, act the same thing as uh, assigning pleasurable activities in a cognitive behavior therapy model because they aren't picking fun things. They're really the things that you have to do, like go to school, do your homework, try and do some of your chores around the house. But it's a, it's a revised expectation that you may not be doing them as well as you did them before you got depressed, but to push yourself and you will get better and your performance will improve as your depression uh, remits. And this is an important conceptualization to give the parents as well so that the parents aren't um, complaining that you're not doing as well, your grades aren't good, your room's a mess, but to sort of say, that's great, I saw that you tried to clean up your room, you're doing your homework, you know, keep going, it'll get easier as you begin to feel better. So we're really encouraging the parents to be less critical and more supportive of the kids' normal activities to help them get up for school on time, uh, to help find a way for them to do their homework at night in a supportive way. Uh, and for the kids to know that they have to get involved and back involved in doing the things that they normally did before they got depressed. So we're going to stop here. And we would like to do a role play, if we can. So we're going to be presenting a case over the next couple of days to give you a sense of the different techniques that we're going to use in IPT. Um, before we do that, I just want to give you a little bit of information about the case that will be helpful. Um, Tara is a 17-year-old female. She's in grade 11. She referred herself to the clinic because she's been experiencing depression symptoms since the start of the school year, with worsening since Christmas. Her symptoms include uh, depressed mood, irritability, fatigue, fluctuations in appetite, decreased concentration, guilt, and worthlessness. She denied suicidal ideation. Tara lives with her mom and her 13-year-old sister. She, her parents have been divorced since she was seven years old. She has weekly visits with her father, um, some weeknights and alternate weekends. Her father lives with his girlfriend of the past eight years and her two teenage sons with whom Tara has a lot of conflict. Um, Dad would very much like her to have a closer relationship both with his partner um, and with these sons, and Tara feels pressure from her dad to do that. In addition, 
uh, Tara's symptoms really uh, date to the beginning of the school year. She had been in a relationship for the past two years with her boyfriend, Eric, who she's still currently dating. Eric is two years older than her, so graduated this year from high school. Um, she found it particularly difficult to go back to high school this year for the first time without Eric, um, as she and Eric had spent most of their days together. They shared a locker, um, and Tara had really not had very many close friends during the past two years at school, and so was finding it particularly difficult to be in school without Eric there. They're still dating. He's at a local college. They still spend a considerable amount of time together. Um, but that's really um, how she describes sort of the onset of her depression symptoms. Uh, she has always been a really good student, but since her depression has started, she's noticed a decrease in concentration and motivation um, for school. So Tara, we've just been uh, reviewing your depression symptoms, and what I want to talk to you about is a little bit, to educate you a little bit on, on what is depression, because what we've talked about is you've been feeling sad a lot, you're not so motivated going to school, you're having trouble concentrating, it sounds like you're not getting pleasure out of the things that you used to like to do, and that you're not getting along with people as much yeah, as that you used to. She is so irritable. So, Mom, you see that at home a lot. Yeah. I mean, with her sister um, and with me, I mean, just everything sort of annoys her. Mm -hmm. And that's part of being depressed. Uh, a depression Ill is a real illness. It affects your functioning, how you get along with people, how you do your schoolwork as a teenager. It doesn't necessarily mean she's doing it on purpose. It's part of the illness where she's not as motivated and feels badly, so she can't do things the way that she used to do. And one of the things that uh, we recommend for teens, whereas sometimes it feels like the best thing to do is to stay home and sleep late and watch television and not go out with your friends, we find that that's not as helpful when you're feeling depressed and that it's a lot more helpful to push yourself to do these things that you normally would have done. So. Um, Mom, we're going to engage you to try and help Tara to do some of these things, but to understand that she may not do them as well as she did them before she got depressed. So um, in terms of getting up for school on time, I'm not sure how, whether you get yourself out the door, whether there's a way that Mom can help make sure that you're up in the morning and can get out so that you're not late, because when you're late, you miss first period, and then you have trouble doing as well in that class, I would guess, right? Yeah. Yeah? Is that what's so. happening? How many days you're missing the first period of school? Um, I would guess about two or three days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that sounds right. And so when they assign homework in that class at night, what happens? I just don't really know. You don't know the material, right? Yeah. And so then you don't do as well. And then how does that make you feel? Just like, uh, you know, it's kind of embarrassing the mm -hmm. next day. Mm -hmm. So in some ways that makes you feel worse rather mm -hmm. than makes your depression feel better. Mm -hmm. So what I like to encourage teens and their parents is to try and figure out how you can get back to school on time, how mom can help you if need be to find a place to do your homework at night, to limit the amount of time you're sort of vegging on the sofa with the television. Um, I don't know if Tara has chores around the house she's supposed to be doing and isn't doing as well. Is that the case? I mean, she's been doing okay. I mean, I feel like it's really that she's just not that interested in going to school this year now that her boyfriend's not there anymore. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that's been the big difference. And then when she's with her dad, um, I think that's been particularly hard for her. At home, she's still doing what she's supposed to do. But I think at your dad's, you're kind of withdrawing. Uh, I don't really like going there as much. Mm -hmm. And so when you're there, you're doing less of what you're supposed to be doing. So it may be that you and dad need to talk mm -hmm. and sort of 
get him on board since we couldn't have him join us today, mm -hmm. but sort of convey to him this notion of to support her in trying to do as many of the things that she should be doing, whatever the chores are around the house, but sort of <laughs> understand that she may not do it perfectly, um, but hopefully as she begins treatment and begins to feel better, she'll be able to do these things back to her normal level. You know, the other thing that it's important to know that is approximately 8 to 10 percent of all adolescents experience a depression at some point in their lifetime. So you're not alone in this. This isn't something that only you are experiencing and other adolescents don't experience. Um, it's pretty common. The good news is that most adolescents get better. Um, and there's a number of different treatments available for depression. We're going to be working with this type of treatment of interpersonal psychotherapy where we're focusing on your relationships and things that are going on in your relationships. And it sounds like already we haven't gotten into it today, but that there's stuff going on with dad that may be affecting your mood, and we're going to look more closely at that. But we're going to focus on those kinds of things and how those relationships are affecting your mood and then preventing you from doing what you're supposed to be doing as a teen, being social, doing well in school, getting out there, and doing those kinds of activities. <clears throat> there are other treatments available besides uh, interpersonal psychotherapy, uh, but we're going to try this treatment first based on what we learned about you in your initial intake appointment. We feel that this would be a treatment that could be quite helpful, but we're going to monitor that closely. And so in the next few weeks, if it looks like you're not improving enough, we'll be open to trying some other treatments. And mom, we would bring you back in to talk about that. And if you don't see improvement, you know, I hope that you would Give me a call if you mm -hmm. want, haven't been to the clinic that week and have concerns that you'll share that with me because you're spending a lot more time with Tara than I am, so you may see things that, that I don't see when she comes in uh, for the session. But our goal will be to monitor your depression symptoms closely and also to really learn about your relationships, who are the important people in your life, where there may be problems in those relationships, and how best um, we can help you to improve those relationships. Does that sound like it makes sense to you? Yeah, I just want her feeling better. I mean, mm -hmm. she's just been a different person. And you know, I know that there's a lot going on for her. So I just hope that this works. Um, Tara, do you have any questions about that? Um, it sounds like that this would work. I'd be willing to give it a try. Mm -hmm. So, especially if it helps out with, um, you know, help me get along better with my dad. Mm -hmm. So that, to you, it seems like that's something that's affecting your mood a lot. Yeah. Now, I also want to let you know, Mom, that most of the time I'm going to be meeting with Tara mm -hmm. alone. She and I are going to talk a lot about relationships and figure out what's the most important focus for our treatment to help her to feel better. It may be that in a few weeks' time we'll invite you back in. Depending on what we decide is the focus of the treatment, mm -hmm. we may invite you back in uh, to work on some of the communication relationship issues. If if Tara and I feel that that would be helpful. But for the next several weeks, I'm really going to be meeting with Tara alone unless, you know, you call me and you have a concern and then uh, we can arrange for you to come in. Okay. I mean, I just want her to sort of just worry and less and, you know, I try to tell her just don't think about it so much and it'll get better, but that hasn't really been working for her. So whatever you can do to make that stop, mm -hmm. that would be really mm -hmm. important. I mean, sometimes it's hard to just stop yourself when you're feeling badly, huh, mm -hmm. Tara? That, that's not that's so not easy. easy. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that we're going to be working on is helping Tara understand the link between her feelings of depression and things that are going on in her life so she can figure out what makes her feel better and what's making her feel worse and how we can 
help fix the things that are making her feel worse. Mm -hmm. So that um, <clears throat> it's a really a problem solving approach to her relationships, try and figure out how she can communicate better, how she can come up with other solutions to problems so that she doesn't have to feel so down and maybe feel, I don't know if you're feeling hopeless when you first came in that things would get better, but our goal is to help you feel that, hey, I've got some things I can do to sort of change things. I don't have to accept everything to, as is. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? No, I think I think you explained it well. Okay, so Tara and I are going to be meeting every week from now on, mm -hmm. uh, and then we will call you in as needed in the next few weeks as we figure out our, our focus. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks.